we're still sort of orbiting around the central figure of Jesus of Nazareth, Jesus Christ. And what does that mean in the 21st century? We've got to figure it out. Like, mm. and a lot of times when we move into a more progressive situation with Christianity, Jesus sort of gets really dumbed down. You know, he starts to look like a hippie that gardens and eats organic food <laughs> and, um, you know, love your enemies and do justice. And those things are really important. Those are integral Christian teachings. The issue is when you only talk about that stuff, mm -hmm. um, Jesus is nothing more than, you know, a basic faceless humanitarian and freedom fighter, which is fine. Um, but it's, it's not quite as distinctive as Christianity actually is. Mm -hmm. And so in that post-Christian conversation, you know, I'm always about, well, why does all of this stuff still matter in terms of distinctly Christian? Yeah. And I think Lent is a really good time to sort of think on some of that. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the podcast. Today, we are joined by a repeat guest, uh, my friend and yours, Maria Francesca French, who's here to talk to us about some ideas from her book, uh, Reconfiguring. It's subtitled A Collection of Post-Christian Thoughts and Theologies. And so, Maria, welcome back to the podcast. I'm excited to have you here. Thank you. It's always really great showing up on your podcast. Obviously, you're a podcaster, but um, you're also a friend. And so it's just always great to be in conversation with you about these things. Thanks awesome. Th me. Yeah, absolutely. So can you start by telling us what this book is? Uh, maybe, you know, it's a collection of essays. So why essays? Where did these essays come from? And how do they kind of feed off of or maybe jump off of your previous book to take us into a deeper layer of the onion? <laughs> yeah, that's actually a really great way of describing it. Um, So my first book, so these two books were actually published five months apart from each other to mm -hmm. the day, which was sort of really interesting. Um, I didn't plan it like that. That's just sort of the way it happened. But boom, boom. my first book, <laughs> yeah, my first book, Safer Than the Known Way, is really like a 30,000 foot look at mm -hmm. the post-Christian faith conversation. You know, what What does it look like? Why has it started? Why might it be the way forward for kind of pilgrims of Christianity that don't find a home in traditional theism um, and certainly don't find themselves in the atheist camp? Mm -hmm. You know, what does post-God faith look like? And so I go through all sorts of things. Um, you know, I, I, I go through various scriptures, I go through various theologies, especially radical theology. I talk about deconstruction, but I talk about it a la Jacques Derrida, which was really the father of deconstruction, how mm -hmm. that word sort of got into the world in the first place and why like that kind of deconstruction, actual true deconstruction is um, really powerful and transformative and and quite brave and moving when we really sort of get to it. Um, you know, I talk about the decline of Christianity in the West and why that's happening. And, um, you know, so, and, and a, really a little bit about my own journey. The first chapter is really autobiographical because while I want my readers to be conversant mm -hmm. with new ways of doing theology and engaging God and sort of a, a faith after belief sort of notion, I suppose. Um, I also want them to know that I've been there and I've mm -hmm. gone through it. I'm not just a theologian or a thinker, a philosopher bringing some, you know, lofty, rarefied ideas to the table, but I've actually mm -hmm. lived to tell. Um, and so this is the result of not only my story, but, you know, over a decade of sort of blood, sweat and tears of research and education and travel and conversation and grief and celebration and loss and death and life. And do you know what I mean? Yeah. So that that was sort of, you know, the the first book I delivered. And I or I always knew that this was going to be my second book, because what I wanted to do was anybody who read safer, I wanted them to sort of be inspired by it, but also be the sense of, okay, well, how does this shake down into everyday life yeah. categories? Yeah. You know, what, what does this look like um, when I have to experience um, someone close to me? Die? How do I deal with death and afterlife now yeah. that I am sort of post the big God in the sky? You know, what does it look like to love and fall in love? What does it um, mean to sort of want to pursue happiness? Um, you know, what, what does it look like to claim to make meaning mm -hmm. outside of, you know, a meaning making God, but still yep. in a Christian narratival 
way. Um, you know, I deal with various high holy holidays because again, if you're post the big God in the sky, but you're still engaging Christianity, what does it look like to engage Christmas <laughs> just outside of a traditional sort of Santa Claus or Silent Night level? Like how are how is Easter, Good Friday, Palms Palms Night? How are all these moments and you know the high holy calendar um not only relevant but deeper um than than they've ever been for yeah. us you know i talk about really problematic constructs that you know most people find themselves traumatized by hell or yeah. rapture or so it's really um and i delve into you know some some really important pieces of of scripture that i think have been used uh pretty horribly <laughs> um for <laughs> probably a lot of um more you know, people coming out of conservative backgrounds. So it's it's actually 41 essays. It's 40 and an epilogue um, about what all this looks like, mm -hmm. kind of broken down into everyday scenarios. I wanted to offer people that. So I was really excited when it came out. It did really well. Um, I know we're having the conversation. It's end of February, but it came out last June. <laughs> yeah, we were supposed um, to have it earlier, but life happens. Right? Yeah, life life <laughs> happens. I'm actually working on a new book, which I'm very excited about. Um, I'm not going to reveal the title quite yet. It's I'm going to sort of be talking about the new book uh, in a reverse way that I did sort of the first one, which means the title will probably be revealed last. But Nice. I like it. Yeah. Awesome. And and these let these essays are letters to your Patreon supporters, correct? Yes. Thank you for bringing that up. Um, so I've had a Patreon since December 2020. Um, and I used for for years, I wrote once a week. Mm -hmm. And over the last year, I've um, lessened that to once a month because it's just gotten too much to write really heavy theological content every week with the way I'm publishing now. But um the the essays for me i had put so much time and mm. effort into them and you know when when someone signs up especially for something like a paid subscription like i don't take that lightly at all and i'm you know not the kind of person who just you know won't sort of reward i guess people's faith in me mm -hmm. <laughs> do you know what i mean sure. so even though they're only paying $5 a month for like you know essays that take me hours <laughs> to write each week I'm still going to like honor their time and the fact that they're, you know, giving their, their money and their resources, um, to, to this platform. And I wanted to sort of give them the best that I could, could offer. Mm -hmm. And I did that for years. And I eventually had like over a hundred, I have over a hundred essays and I just thought, you know, I'm going to take a handful of these and I'm going to publish them because I just think I want them out there in the wider world. So yeah. that's, that's sort of, and, and they're all dated. Mm -hmm. Um, and while they're in, chronological order you know you'll see weeks and months skipped at a time because when I published this I had over 100 and I chose 41 mm -hmm. um but but they they are in chronological order so yeah what I love yeah. about that though is like as I was reading it it was it felt like you were writing it was like a, a letter to me like addressing a question that I might have yeah. so it was a very personal way and I love what you said earlier even about your first book about how everything that you write comes from a very personal place because there are so many writers out there who have really great ideas and they're fantastic ideas they're well researched ideas but you can almost tell in the reading that like they haven't really experienced at a real depth the stuff that they're talking about whereas when I'm reading these letters that you're writing you know you're sharing stories from your life you're sharing about how different thoughts have evolved in your life over time and I think that's such a powerful way to hook somebody in and to really help them see like a different perspective because like I'm living this right now you've lived this and now you've evolved to this place and now that gives me some hope that maybe I can get out of these weeds <laughs> as well yeah absolutely and I always wanted to feel like a journey like not not only my patron which I curate to feel like a journey and a community mm -hmm. between you know me and and the people who are signed up there but anything I offer certainly in my books I wanted to feel like we're in this together yeah. and I may be on the other side of you know the work <laughs> in terms of I'm the writer and the author but like we're all figuring this out and sort of doing it together and so while I do bring some challenging theological and philosophical concepts to the table because I think a good author should always challenge their readers mm -hmm. um 
you know, I don't want you to read my books and be like, oh yeah, every single last morsel made sense. And I got right. it all. Why did I even <laughs> read it? Because I already knew that all in the first place. Right. You know, you should be challenged and you should have some question marks, but you all should also should have, you know, huge moments of resonance and just saying, ah, yes, I see myself in this. I can identify with this. This makes sense. And maybe I don't understand all of it, but I, I want to keep going because this yeah. feels good and this feels right. And it's part of my journey. So yeah. the, the letter thing was kind of cool. It it just sort of really organically came about because I am writing missives to my Patreon supporters mm -hmm. um, each week or now each month. And I do sign each one. Um, uh, yours, Marie, is, is that how I sign it? Uh, Let me I see. Think, um, yeah. uh, until next time you're Marie. Yeah. So, yeah, so yeah. That's, I had to look really quick. So that that's how each one ended on Patreon. And I mm -hmm. kept that. I was like, I want this to feel casual, but intimate, you yeah. know? I was writing this for a group of people and it's still being written for that same group of people. That group has just sort of enlarged now. So yeah, it's really yeah. good. Can we back up to something you said earlier? You said you're talking about deconstruction and you talked about how, and correct me if I'm, if I'm miss, if I'm misquoting you, but something along the lines of like deconstruction as it was originally is a little bit different than what we might call pop <laughs> modern deconstruction <laughs> yeah. because I, I see a lot of people obviously throwing around the word it's all over the place and a lot of times I feel like I'll read something I'm like I don't really know if how this person or this group is defining deconstruction doing deconstruction is really what true deconstruction is so can you maybe speak a little bit to the difference of those two things yeah. So I don't want to say that, you know, the modern pop culture conversation on deconstruction is wrong. I mean, people are allowed to take terms and words sure, and sure, sure. reauthor them and make them useful for their own yep. journeys. And, and I totally get that. But deconstruction is such a striking word, mm -hmm. um, especially sort of uh, in the philosophical community, you know, the latter half of the, the 20th century and certainly <laughs> into the 21st century that, you know, when, when it first rose to the top in the current conversation, you know, me and some friends and some colleagues, we were just like, <laughs> Where this come? You know, like, does, <laughs> does this have any connection to the work of Jacques Derrida right. and Mark Taylor and, <laughs> you know, now John Caputo and all the philosophers and theologians who are sort of um, using it in a certain way. So, in fact, a couple of years ago, I did a podcast with John Caputo. I was interviewing him for a podcast I had at the time. And, um, you know, John, he's just so amazing as a theologian philosopher and so prolific with what he's been able to publish in his life and, and mm. the work he's done. Um, and he was very close with with Derrida up until his death in the early 2000s. Mm. And so he's done a ton with with deconstruction and hauntology and all of these Derridian um, concepts. Mm. And, you know, my, me and my colleague said to him, we said, you know, do, do you realize right now that deconstruction is being used at like a very popular level to denote sort of the dismantling and disentwining of toxic fundamental beliefs and he's like no i had no idea but send me more i'm so interested that this word yeah. is you know has, has been connected in that way so i mean essentially and just so everyone knows i have a, a really big chapter i believe it's chapter five where i talk all about deconstruction mm -hmm. um and i do connect it to sort of uh, in safer than the known way my first book mm -hmm. um i do connect it to modern day uh conversation on deconstruction but again going back to sort of the root of this word um and how it has been, you know, used in the past, I I always think is really helpful. And so essentially, you know, deconstruction was employed as a literary term, mm -hmm. first and foremost, and then was sort of applied to communication. And, you know, um, anybody who's read a little bit of Derrida knows kind of the, the famous, um, I guess, trope or one liner of, you know, nothing but the text. Mm. Um, and it's the sense of everything we need to know is sort of housed within the text and nothing sort of exists outside of it. And so part of our job um, is to respect the text in the sense of to get what's at really inside of it. Mm -hmm. And I remember when I heard these terms for the first time in graduate school and seminary, it really resonated with me because what I started to learn was, you know, we bring as readers, as empirical readers, we bring a lot of baggage to the text, mm -hmm. you know, what we've heard, what we thought we understood about it, maybe what our pastor has told us about it, something we read about it, historical understandings of it, um, you know, but what is actually the text constructing for us, you mm -hmm. know, that we're not bringing, or are we, are we aware of like our presuppositions, you know, are we aware of how it's been, you know, used through, through the ages, throughout history, throughout, you know, traditional, mm -hmm. um, 
you know, paradigms and, and notions and all of that. So it's the sense of like really interrogating the text mm -hmm. and sort of getting to really kind of what's what's housed within it. And in order to do that, you sort of have to deconstruct what it's been made to be. Now, mm -hmm. if a Derridian scholar were to hear me say all this, they'd be like, okay, that was super reductionistic <laughs> and a really <laughs> oversimplified um, explanation of it. But, you know, just in a, in a couple of words, that is really sort of how deconstruction was really offered up. And then it started mm. sort of being applied to other various philosophical notions. Um, you know, at the, the end of the 20th century into the 21st century, it started being theologically appropriated, um, you know, in terms of what does it look like to not even get at like the original intent because that's impossible. Mm -hmm. But again, almost treating like the text and the communication and the thought within the text, which can potentially all be different things, getting to sort of the very root of it all, which essentially is kind of an impossible thing. And mm -hmm. so what it does is it keeps us on this journey of a spiral, not a circle, but a spiral that keeps us going. And every time we go around and around to engage the text again, or engage this thing that is open to deconstruction, um, every time we go around, we find that we are more transformed by it and yeah. fall a little bit deeper into it in yeah. pursuit of meaning, but also being haunted Um by everything that we thought we knew about it. So it kind of, the haunting isn't everything. Like when ghosts haunt, they're sort of like, you know, these annoying little, you know, whatever, <laughs> maybe gnats sort of flying, you know, around our ears or they come to us in dreams. And it's just really an essence, really kind of a reminder and a pro provocation yeah. to sort of awaken us to something new. And we follow that. And sometimes it leads us to a dead end and that's okay. It means that we back up and we go in a different direction, but the journey never ends yeah. um, because the destination huh. actually is sort of impossible. But again, the search for the impossible is what drives the search. Um, and that's why radical theologians talk all the time about the impossible God as opposed to the possible one, you yeah. know, the undeconstructible God as huh. opposed to the deconstructible one, you know, the unnameable, the uncontainable, um, the unknowable. Um, which is a very sort of apophatic way of speaking and isn't quite good enough, but language is very broken and it's sort of all we have. So we do our best. And that's part of deconstruction too, is knowing that language is so broken and that it's always just our very best yet feeble attempt to describe some, to describe something that actually cannot be described in, in terms at all, which yeah. again, keeps that journey going forever. And I think the reason why theologians started attaching on to concepts like deconstruction, not the pop culture conversation, because that I wouldn't even say is so much a conversation of theologians as it is sort of everyday, you know, people trying to grapple with their their Christian past, which is is a wonderful thing. Mm -hmm. um, but I think the, the reason why theologians started grabbing onto this term is because it really invited us into a journey that is completely unending. And that yeah. is more about sort of our transformation in the journey. Um, than anything else and also releasing all sorts of control on anything we might have thought we knew or anything we thought we could hang our hat on yeah. um, to sort of never get comfortable in in one stage of faith yeah. uh, in a sense yeah. so i there's a lot more to say about that and as you can see i've just totally word vomited on you no about... i was perfect i was perfect because um, as you're talking i'm thinking about like there's so many times in my story of deconstruction where i've had people from my former tribe like mm. accuse me of you know like well you're deconstructing so you're throwing everything away you know mm. you're you're dismantling everything like there's nothing left like you've given up on god i'm like no like i feel like for me my deconstruction journey has been trying to get to a point that i know i can never get to which is that original intent i said but the the journey of trying to get there is yeah. so fascinating and has only deepened my love and my appreciation for God, the person of Jesus, uh, yeah. the scriptures and things like that. Like I think yeah. about like, you know, at first encountering like Rob Bell's work and his work yeah. with Velvet Elvis yeah. And, yeah. and Love Wins and things like that. I'm like, wow, this yeah. is so interesting to see this take. But then I read through his like bibliography and he mentions this guy, John Dominic Cross. And so I go and get yeah. his book. I'm like, oh, this is even more interesting. And then Cross mentions like, a, you know, a Bart Ehrman, I go get his, some of his books. I'm like, oh, this is even more interesting, but I'm just going down this rabbit hole where I'm not abandoning the Bible. I read the Bible still almost every day, but 
but I feel like I have a much deeper appreciation for it. That it's no longer this book of systematic theologies where I take these random verses to build this yeah. ivory tower that I can sit in and tell myself that I'm right because that's what I used to do. But now I'm like, I'm digging deeper beneath that tower, trying to get to like the root of what these different stories really meant and what these you know, authors really meant. And I know I can never get there because like you said, that's impossible, but it's the journey of trying to get there. That's so fascinating to me. It is the journey of trying. And, you know, I think that's why, like when people ask me, like, why, why post-Christianity, why the Christianity in, in post, like, why not just be out of it altogether? Mm -hmm. And I think everyone has to ask, answer that question for themselves. And some people do choose to get out of it altogether. Some people yeah. are, you know, rightly wanting to be atheists or, you know, maybe more palatable agnostics. Um, but for me or someone who, who you know, would would have this sort of mindset is that you know this isn't a departure really mm -hmm. it's yeah. just the next step um yeah. of pursuing the the curiosity and imagination that has always driven my yeah. faith yeah. um yeah that's so good all right one of the questions i want to ask you the, the biggest question i want to ask you today um is because at the time of this recording we're approaching easter we're in the season of lent yes, and so a lot of people are. are a lot of people are writing about and thinking about especially in the world of deconstruction, like, what do I believe about the cross <laughs> these mm. days? What do I believe about yeah. Jesus? You know, all these different kinds yeah. of things. And you have this one line in the book, and I wrote it here on my screen. Uh, you say something along the lines of, when it comes to Jesus and the cross, you didn't leave the cross behind, mm. nor did you nail yourself to it. And I think that's such a thought-provoking statement that I've had swirling in my mind really ever mm. since I I read it, but I was wondering if you could talk to us a little bit about, especially in this time of the year, like what are your thoughts about Jesus, the cross, atonement, like all those different things, maybe like, where were you with all that stuff in the past? Where are you today? And what was it like to get from A to B? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's more like A to X or H. Right. <laughs> Or at very least A to T or something like that. Something um, like that. <laughs> just not Z. Right. Not um, yeah, you know, it's funny that we're having this conversation now because I am like knee deep in Lenten mm -hmm. study and um, God, I hate to use the word meditation. What's the word that I want, Glenn? Um, Lenten. Lenten. Uh... Exploration. Yeah mysterious you know, exploration kind of sits, i like that yeah, yeah just kind of sitting with it and it's funny because lent hit, hits me sort of re, really different every contemplation year. how's that yeah yeah okay right, that better maybe that was the <laughs> word i was searching for really deep into lenten contemplation at the moment um mm. you know the last i'd say two to three years of lent for me it was all about um death and sort of you know memento more and and thinking on mortality often and sort of switching it really from an evangelical mentality on thinking about death often because an evangelical or a fundamental um, idea of death or at least death motivating towards life is eternal life. Mm -hmm. You know, this is this world is not all there is and it's just a blip and you're going to die sooner than you think. And so live for eternal life, yeah. but live with death in mind. And, you know, ever since I sort of came out of that faith mindset, which has been many years now, um, but it's also taken me many years to sort of explore the other side of that <laughs> is that I'm still thinking on death, but the script has been flipped in a sense. Now I think on death, not because I'm looking forward to what's after death, but because life is so valuable and we only get this one bit of life. And so how am I going to honor it and live it well? Uh -huh. um, but this year I'm kind of in a Jesus season, which is interesting because um I don't want this is going to sound so um, crude, but uh, I, I kind of go in and out of my times um, engaging with Jesus. Um, I'm always ready to talk about Jesus because mm -hmm. I think it's super important to do. I'm always ready to sort of talk about the cross and the resurrection. And that's one thing that I'm, uh, I really tout a lot in this post-Christian conversation is there's a reason why we're post-Christian. Um, there's a reason why we're still using that word Christian. You know, we're still sort of orbiting around this central figure of Jesus of Nazareth, Jesus Christ. And what does that mean in the 21st century? We've got to figure it out. Like, mm. and a lot of times when we move into a more progressive situation with Christianity, Jesus sort of gets really dumbed down. 
you know, he starts to look like a hippie that gardens and eats organic food <laughs> and, um, you know, love your enemies and do justice. And those things are really important. Those are integral Christian teachings. The issue is when you only talk about that stuff, mm -hmm. um, Jesus is nothing more than, you know, a basic faceless humanitarian and freedom fighter, which is fine. Um, but it's, it's not quite as distinctive as Christianity actually is. Mm -hmm. And so in that post-Christian conversation, you know, I'm always about, well, why does all of this stuff still matter in terms of distinctly Christian? Yeah. And I think Lent is a really good time to sort of think on some of that, to engage some of that, even if we don't have the answers, because we don't always, mm -hmm. and sometimes the answers are uncomfortable, or maybe they're, we think they're the wrong answers or whatever. Um, but I think when we look at, so in terms of your question, how mm -hmm. I used to engage versus how I engage now, I don't think I have to sort of, you know, uh, extrapolate the whole kind of evangelical notion right. of a personal savior and, and why I've moved on from that. And I talk yeah. a lot about in both of my books, why I think having a personal relationship with Jesus is actually superfluous and really completely unnecessary in a public way that mm -hmm. is sure. um, to the, to the, the true and central mission of, of Christianity and the radical imperatives of the new Testament. Um, so I would say like at this stage in my life, rather than wanting to sort of be the, um, you know, the Mary at his feet or the beloved disciple that, you know, <laughs> reclines next to him in his, you know, shoulder blades at, at the, at the last supper, as we see in John, um, I'm more wanting to sort of, um, you know, be Nicodemus who's like hanging at the top of the tree, just trying to get a view or, mm. you know, I don't want to be one of the women or James at the foot of the cross, like, you know, crying and sort of being soaked in sweat and blood, like in the storm. I kind of want to be further away as I'm trying to sort of make out what Jesus might be uttering to, you know, the thieves on either side of him and sort of being a little mystified by that and wondering what it all means and why this is happening. And, you know, I don't want to be a forerunner, like waving palms as Jesus is coming into <laughs> Jerusalem, yeah. but I kind of want to be in the middle of the city and being like, oh, okay. Um, you know, here we have a Roman prefect, like entering one side of Jerusalem, you know, victory in battle. And on this side, we have this guy who claims to be <laughs> a Jewish Messiah coming in on a donkey. Like what is going on? Yeah. Here? <laughs> you yeah. know what I mean? So it's sort of like backing uh -huh. away and sort of observing and like asking more questions rather than coming to the table with these really neatly fitted answers, because, mm -hmm. you know, the truth is there, there are no neatly fitted answers you know mm. jesus dies on a cross alone um you know he's he's looking for his disciples which we can see you know at the night of gethsemane you know fell asleep when all he wanted to do was not be alone mm. all he wanted was you know sit up and pray with me in fact a little shameless plug i don't know when this is going to air but in april um my publisher choir is coming out with a compilation on Jesus. And mm -hmm. I am one of the contributing authors and my chapter is called Jesus Relic or Radical. And I engage mm -hmm. Jesus the night in Gethsemane because mm -hmm. I think that we pass over that a lot um, in favor for like the more quote unquote important yeah. story of the, yeah. the cross and the resurrection. But, mm -hmm. you know, um, he's, he's asking, you know, his God and his father, like, I don't really want to die. Can this cup just pass for me? Is it possible? Like he starts sweating blood, which is a real medical condition that is like induced by the ultimate stress, you know, that you can think of, yeah. you know, going into, you know, the, the trial, um, and Pontius Pilate sort of offering up his, his verdict, uh, and letting sort of the people, he, Jesus knows he has like no hope. Um, you know, up on the cross when he's crying out to God and the heavens are just, they've just closed. Like this God has just vaporized into the background has totally abandoned, mm -hmm. you know, uh, Jesus, uh, it's what, um, the likes of, uh, Slava Zizek, uh, calls an atheist moment yeah. <laughs> for Jesus yeah. on the cross, you know, and then you have this hope of the resurrection, which is a really sort of powerful, um, and, and highly Jewish in terms of an eschatological hope and narrative that came out of the end of Second Temple Judaism to give people hope as ethnic Israel was just sort of being, you know, annihilated under mm. foreign rule and occupation. You know, by the time Jesus makes it onto the scene in the first century, we have two tribes out of the 12 left, and they're desperately trying to hold on to their sense of national and ethnic identity, you know, and, and resurrection really meant something to them much more than 
you know, any Western concept of like, oh, someday we'll be resurrected and we'll kind of leave the earth and kind of go to heaven. It was actually mm -hmm. a real thing and it was really powerful and people didn't use that language unless it was true. And that's why you have the disciples saying, well, what, was it his angel? Was it his ghost? They understood those. those. <laughs> to say resurrection was like, you don't really mean resurrection, do you? Because that means something has started, something yeah. that we've been waiting to really, you know, so it's like, these mm. things are so amazing and so powerful and so transformative. But, you know, we sell ourselves short. We sell scriptures short. We sell, you know, the Judeo-Christian narrative short um, yeah. when we engage them in sort of these really one-dimensional, propositional, systematized, you know, ways of, of doing theology that is incredibly anemic and unhelpful. Yeah. So. I mean, I, and, I mean, I've just gotten super passionate about, it. but, but this is just like one little way you can engage Jesus outside of personal savior narratives, which yeah. I don't think are super helpful. Um, you know, right now, like I said, I'm sort of knee deep in, in some Lenten thoughts where I'm really kind of focusing on the way the apostle John um, in his gospel mm -hmm. focuses on his relationship with Jesus, because, you know, we're told that this was the beloved disciple and potentially, you know, an eyewitness, irrespective of what you want to say about dating. And yeah. this is why taking the text on the text terms is so important because mm -hmm. it throws the need for dating out the window, because we're not so concerned with the dating. We're concerned with what, irrespective of who empirically wrote this <laughs> narrative we want to know what this narrative is trying to tell us about Jesus. That's right. um, and that that's the important thing. And, and so we take the text on the text terms. We respect it. We can question it. We can challenge it. It can handle it. Yeah. <laughs> it yeah. can, it's totally up for the challenge. Um, you know, but really kind of seeing what Jesus was communicating during this, this time of, of Lent, you know, starting, you know, with, um, well, not starting with because Lent came, you know, the time we know as Lent came much later, but like even when he's calling the disciples and when John the Baptist is, you know, switching his mantle to, to the mantle of Christ and what that means going from the law to like the, not only the lawgiver, but like the law fulfiller and what yeah. happened in Jesus. Do we see the end of religion? Yeah. Do we see like the ultimate fulfillment of meaning? Do we see like no longer do we need sacrifice no longer do we need like religious ritual like right. no longer do we need even like religious um paradigms and and all of it like it's it's actually quite radical when you really get into it and so for me i'm sort of knee deep in in that thought now and you can expect to that's going to be showing up on my patreon for the next several weeks for sure yeah but they, again it's just it's just small examples not mm -hmm. small they're they're quite mind-blowing but like just a few really of yeah. the amazing ways we can engage jesus and christianity outside of that personal savior motivation. yeah i love all of that because i was i was thinking this past week about my history in the church especially during this time of the year and i can't tell you how many times like we had a good Friday service in my churches growing up and I went to a private Christian school. So we had like good Friday services there as well. And in so many of those services, especially in, in the last church I was at, what we would do is we get, get together on good Friday. There'd be a giant wooden cross at the front yeah. of the room. Mm -hmm. The lights are all dim. So it's really dark when you go in, there's like red fl floodlights on the walls, you know, to make it like that creepy kind of bloody feeling. <laughs> There's really low music playing. You know, the oh, pastor yeah. gets up, has a very short, you know, dull kind of monologue-ish sermon. Yeah. And then, you know, the band comes and they, they play this very low song and they, they invite you to write your sins on a note card and you go up to the front. And there's this 400 people. So it's a long line and you take a hammer and a nail and you nail your sin to the cross. And so literally for like 40 minutes, all you hear in the sanctuary is this banging of a hammer, you know, and it's all the, the theology that's given is about, you know, our sin and about, you know, God's anger towards sin and all these different things. And I can remember even like pre deconstruction thinking to myself, like, there's gotta be more yeah. than this. Like this just seems like we've, we've taken this story that for whatever reason has endured for 2000 years to the point yeah. where it's still on my shelf and your shelf and everybody's mm -hmm. shelf in many places growing dust. Some, sometimes we read it all the time, whatever, but that story has endured. Like, mm -hmm. what is it about this story that has captured mm -hmm. people's attention for so long? And so I love like what you were saying about 
like you find yourself being you know like um and like these different characters in the, yeah. in the in the stories and like looking at jesus from there and i'm finding myself these days like in the nicodemus kind of place where you go to jesus like at night and i, I feel like i'm asking him like what exactly is your deal like who what what, <laughs> what did you mean when you said this and like what what why did you do this and like what is it about this story like i'm asking all these different kinds of questions and even though i feel like i don't even like nicodemus like i, I go away not really still understanding like he comes up later in the story right because he's there later on in the story he's there at the end of the story like he still sticks around and i feel like i'm saying to jesus like i don't understand you but i'm gonna stick around because i feel like you have really good things to share. And I feel like, you know, going back to what you said before about deconstruction, about continuing to dig through that mystery and becoming mm -hmm. more and more comfortable with the unknowing of things yeah. that I feel like I used to know and allowing those, those feelings to just wash over me and be like a wave that propels me into the next seasons of my life with Jesus. So that's what I feel like I'm at right now with yeah. the cross and all the different things. I have no answers. I have no solid you know, theologies, I just enjoy the story and the mystery and the wonder. And uh, that's what I'm trying to embrace this Easter of 2024. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think that's wonderful. And, you know, if there's one thing the Gospels don't do is mm -hmm. it, they don't put pressure on us to know and to that's have right. it all figured out, like we're allowed to be on a journey. And, you know, as I look at the disciples that Jesus called, you know, they were, if you really look at how they all interacted, like one by one, if you don't like, you know, just mesh them together as a group of <laughs> disciples, but if you really look at like each one's interaction with Christ throughout the gospels, like at one time or another, we could probably all see ourselves like as, you know, we were Peter at one point and then we were Andrew and then we were John and maybe even sometimes we were Judas. And do you know yeah. what I mean? Because they all have such different reactions to them. Sure. And he has different relationships with each of them. Like he asks them different questions. He responds to them differently. Like, um, so, I mean, I think it's, I think it's okay to identify with like we were just saying a moment ago, different characters in the narratives, yeah. but also to sort of bring your own character to, to the narrative as well. Um, I just said what the gospels don't do, but one thing the gospels absolutely do is invite us in, I think, to sort of be be key players and key actors in, in the story and to keep right. the story going, to keep right. the writing of it. That's right. So good. Maria, we were just about out of time, but this has yeah. been a blast so thank you for we were really we were really bible-y today normally we i'm were. like jesus the more theological and side and spirity <laughs> look at us I'm a, I'm a bit in in my my jesus era at the moment and it sounds like you are too so so it's yes. all right so this Who would have great. Thought. thank you <laughs> yes yeah, a lot of fun real quick anywhere you want to point people to any kind of social media any kind of specifics of your work you want people to go check out yeah, um, kind of the one-stop area really for everything I'm involved in is my website, which is mariafrancescafrench.com. Um, I have a Pathios links there. I have um, my my Patreon column there. Um, I do other things with other organizations. It's all there. My books, any chapters I'm writing or being a part of, um, it's, it's all there. And especially if you want to get in touch with me, say hello, follow me on social media, just head to the website. It's, it's all linked. Awesome. All the links are in the show notes and we'll do it again sooner than the last time. Indeed. <laughs> all right. <laughs>